Uh, last time we mentioned that uh, in the 20th century, uh, theoretical physics made uh, great progress. Uh, and I had said that uh, analyzing the progress throughout the century, there are three melodies which uh, together in some sense define the progress of uh, theoretical physics in that century. And the first was uh, quantization. The greatest achievement of the physics of the 19th century were three. First, thermodynamics, second, the electromagnetism, third, the statistical mechanics. Thermodynamics was uh, uh, finally formulated in terms of the first and second law of thermodynamics uh, around the middle of the 19th century. Uh, both laws have become uh, firmly anchored in the mind of uh, physicists. Electromagnetism was gradually developed through the works of uh, uh, many experimental physicists uh, and through the ideas of uh, Faraday. Finally, in 1865, uh, Maxwell wrote down Maxwell's uh, equations, which were not immediately understood, but uh, which produced gradually a profound effect. In particular, after Maxwell's death, Hertz developed the electromagnetic, discovered electromagnetic waves by having a spark at one end of the room, room and discovering it by what we would now call an antenna in another part of the room. So after, Max, after Hertz's discovery, there was no doubt that there is electromagnetic waves and that uh, uh, light, uh, visible light, is a kind of el electromagnetic wave. Third, uh, there was statistical mechanics. Uh, one might at first say that uh, statistical mechanics must be a consequence of the chemist's ideas about the atom. We all know that Dalton had uh, already formulated the concept of the atom at the beginning of the 19th century. And the chemistry made great use of that. So the existence of the idea of the atom was uh, almost quantitatively already started at the beginning of the 19th century. However, if you look into the literature, you will find that there was great confusion because uh, such things like uh, uh, isotopes, uh, we know chlorine has uh, two isotopes, uh, so that the, the atomic weight of chlorine uh, is fractional. And that uh, made the chemists, uh, many chemists doubt that this atomic idea was uh, realistic. Uh, many chemists felt that it was only a kind of approximate uh, model and did not consist, uh, was not consistent with uh, real uh, material atoms. So there was a great confusion, and in that great confusion, there was born statistical mechanics. Through the work of Maxwell, and then Boltzmann, and finally Gibbs, uh, it was uh, found that the concept of heat transfer and the such things like viscosity and uh, specific heat were all explainable in terms of atomic uh, theory. But uh, another very powerful group of people headed by Mach, Mach opposed that. So the opposition between those people for the atomic theory, for statistical mechanics, and those opposed to it was uh, a great battle at the end of the 19th uh, century. Uh, that great battle was very depressing for Boltzmann because uh, Boltzmann's uh, lifelong work was about uh, atomic theory. And uh, 
that depression undoubtedly contributed to Boltzmann finally committed the suicide in 1906 uh, in Italy, where he was uh, taking a vacation. A new thing is happening. In the last decades of the 19th century, great advances in experimental physics opened the door to the physics of the 20th century. In particular, in the last 10 years of the 19th century, there was discovered the electron, there was discovered radioactivity, both through experiments. Theoretically, at the turn of the century, the dominant theoretical puzzles were first, ether, whether there exists the ether. Second, and that's related to statistical mechanics, the number of degrees of freedom of diatomic gases. Third, the black body radiation. I will explain all three of them a little bit. In retrospect, these great experimental developments and these theoretical puzzles prepared the fertile grounds for the physics of the 20th century. About the ether, there was the microsome mole experiment performed in the last 20 years of the 19th century, and they detected no medium. If you want to put it in one sentence, is that they looked for a medium uh, in which Earth travels, but they found no such a medium. About the specific heat, uh, the diatomic gas specific heat was very confusing. In 1902, Gibbs published his great work, Elementary Principles of Statistical Mechanics. I highly recommend this uh, little book to you. It's, uh, it reads like a poem. It was uh, very elegant, and uh, it was the basis of uh, all the equilibrium statistical mechanics of the 20th century. And in the introduction to that book, which was uh, Gibbs' greatest uh, work, Gibbs said, we do not escape difficulties in as simple a matter as the number of degrees of freedom for a diatomic gas. It is well known that while theory would assign to the gas six degrees of freedom per molecule, in our experiments on specific heat, we cannot account for more than five. Certainly, when is building on insecure foundations who rests his work on hypothesis concerning the constitution of matter. What he was referring to was the fact that there were strong oppositions to the uh, atomic theory of the constitution of matter. And indeed, the, the opposition was not totally groundless because uh, such a simple thing like the specific heat of a diatomic molecule was not explained by the then um, uh, uh, atomic theory of matter. Lastly, black body radiation. Starting in 1860, uh, there was a Kirchhoff's law. Uh, in Germany, around that time, there were intensive studies of uh, thermal phenomena, in particular, of uh, the black body radiation. In the last 30 years of the 19th century, more accurate experiments were done on electromagnetic radiation in a box V. In, 17, in 1879, Stephen in Vienna had conjectured that the electromagnetic radiation in a box V has an energy E equal to a constant times temperature, absolute, absolute temperature to the fourth power. You remember that uh, around before that, the concept of the absolute temperature was already formulated through the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, Stephen conjectured that the black body radiation in a volume 
uh, has total energy proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. Some five or six years later, Boltzmann in 1884 proved Stevens' uh, conjecture by showing mechanically that radiation exerts the pressure P equal to one third E over V. Uh, you can uh, you can think about how this uh, uh, that the energy per unit volume is related to the pressure. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, let me just give you a hint. Where does the factor one third come from? It is that V. If uh, the Vx squared average is equal to Vy squared average is equal to Vz squared average, then obviously you have this one-third. And this one-third is the origin of this one-third. Uh, think about it. He was uh, thinking of, uh, uh, of light bouncing back and forth in a box. And uh, by bouncing, it exerts a pressure on the wall. The remarkable fact of this uh, Boltzmann derivation was that that was before Hertz had shown in 1887 the existence of electromagnetic waves. So this is a characteristic of frontiers research in any field. Uh, everything becomes crystal clear after the great discoveries. But uh, before the great discoveries, they were groping. So although electromagnetism was not yet confirmed, through Hertz's discovery of electromagnetic waves. But the vague idea was already there, and Boltzmann seized on that. And using this uh, simple argument, he arrived at the, that derivation. How, with that formula, with that one-third factor, Boltzmann derived the, the Stephen law is uh, on this uh, transparency. But uh, it is also assigned as an exercise, so I will not uh, explain this transparency further. The Stephen Boltzmann law played an important part in Planck's 1900 discovery, which began modern physics. Also in, 19, in 1893, uh, Vince discovered the Vince displacement law. All of these were of crucial importance about uh, uh, around the year 1900. Later on, Planck said, the derivation of Stevens' law by Boltzmann was the first great advance in radiation theory since Kirchhoff. When Wien discovered his displacement law nine years later, one had come as far as was at all possible with the help of the laws of thermodynamics and of the general electromagnetic theory. And the point had been reached where the special radiation theories had to set in, which are based on definite ideas about the mechanism of the phenomena. Sorry, this was said by Lawrence in 1907. In other words, in 1907, reflecting on what happened, Lawrence remarked, that the discoveries of the 19th century were setting the stage for what was going to happen. But when Lawrence wrote this in 1907, this, the situation about light consisted of photons was not yet uh, clarified. So the opening of 20th century physics was through the work of Planck. Planck wrote two papers in the year 1900. In October 1900, he discovered the radiation formula. And two years, two months later, he discovered the idea, the initial idea that 
light uh, energy exchange with uh, the wall is a unit of H nu. The first paper, the October paper, was curve fitting because at that time there were accurate experiments about the black body radiation. And uh, one day in October, uh, Rubens, an experimental physicist, presented to Planck the experimental data. In particular, the data included the high frequencies and the Planck looked at that and made this uh, fit, uh, which is now very well known. That's the, the formula, is the density per d nu of uh, the radiation in per unit volume. The important paper was the second one. In December 14th, uh, Planck published this paper. Here is the translation of the beginning of the paper on the theory of the energy distribution of the normal spectrum. Gentlemen, when some weeks ago I had the honor to draw your attention to a new formula, and that formula was the one I just showed, we consider, however, this is the most essential point of the whole calculation. E to be composed of a well-defined number of equal parts and use thereto the constant of nature h. This constant multiplied by the common frequency nu of the resonators gives us an energy element uh, E in ergs, etc., etc. What the Planck considered was a... He was trying to explain why there is that formula. And uh, he was totally groping in the dark. So he thought that uh, perhaps the wall consists of, of uh, oscillators. This oscillator would, he considered harmonic oscillators. And he wanted the harmonic oscillator to exchange energy with the, with the radiation field. And he found through 40 reasoning, the bold new idea, the revolution launched by Planck, was in the second paper, where Planck used the Boltzmann's uh, formula, S equal to K log W. Uh, this is the center. This formula, S equal to K log W, uh, called the Boltzmann's law, is of course the center of uh, the whole field of st statistical mechanics. Planck used this formula and used his model and said that uh, I now understand why there is uh, that uh, uh, fit. If the exchange of energy is in terms of uh, H nu, uh, integral units of H nu. However, if you examine that paper, as uh, Pais has uh, examined very carefully, the argument was wrong. Uh, Planck had a derivation. The derivation was incorrect. It was incorrect because at that time, the idea of uh, both Einstein's, Einstein's statistics was not yet known. So as a consequence, the counting, to use S equal to K log W, W is equal to the number of, uh, is the number of number of arrangements, so he had to count. And his counting method was what is now called Boltzmann counting, which we know is wrong, which we know is not correct for this problem. So as a consequence, uh, fortuitously, Planck used a wrong idea of Boltzmann, or wrongly used the idea of Boltzmann, and the forced into a derivation which gave rise to uh, the profound uh, uh, revolution, which is quantum mechanics. Now, I, I want you to realize that that is very common. There are many, many discoveries, important discoveries in physics, which 
or started with a wrong der derivation. But this is because when you are trying very hard to under something very, very mysterious, you sometimes, uh, in some sense intuitively, arrive at something which, however, was not supported by logic, and that is uh, very common. But anyway, Planck's conclusion through his uh, wrong analysis was that, the, that matter absorbs and emits radiation in units of H nu. This was born quantum theory and modern physics. Then came Einstein. In 1905, Einstein wrote a paper. He was uh, 26 years old, and we all know that was the year in which he also wrote a paper that uh, became special relativity. He wrote a paper called On a His His Heuristic Point of View Concerning the Generation and Conversion of Light. What is meant by heuristic? Heuristic means genuine by experience. It's not by logic. What the Einstein realized was that what Planck did was not logically correct. So, uh, many years later, Einstein wrote, the imperfections of that derivation, that derivation meaning Planck's derivation, the imperfections of that derivation remain at first hidden, which is most fortunate for the development of physics. To know what was uh, the thing which was most puzzling, uh, we have to real. Uh, we have to first look at the Rayleigh-Jeans law. The Rayleigh-Jeans law was not really de uh, derived by Rayleigh and Jeans; it was derived by Einstein. So some people call it Rayleigh-Jeans-Einstein law. Now. To derive this law by equipartition, it's very simple. The important thing is that we know there are electromagnetic fields in a box. So if we have a box of volume V, and we want to know how much electromagnetic field there is in it, the, first we have to know how many degrees of freedom, how many different Electromagnet electromagnetic uh, modes uh, there are. Well, the easiest way to do that is you think of, mo this is now momentum space. In the momentum space, you have um, each point, this is a three-dimensional momentum space, each point represents a, a wave vector. So, if you talk about the radius p, and we look at the, this ring, the, the total number of uh, the volume in this ring is 4 pi p squared. That's the area times dp. That's the total volume in this uh, shaded momentum space. This times the volume. This is the uh, momentum space volume times coordinate space volume divided by h cube. That, according to statistical theory, is the number of modes. Number of electromagnetic modes. Except for each k, there are two polarizations. So you have to multiply this by two. This too is due to, so, so we now know the number of modes is equal to, is equal to 8 pi p square dp v over h cube. But cp 
is equal to h nu. Cp is the energy, is equal to h nu. So P is equal to h over C nu. So if I substitute that in there, I get number of modes per volume is equal to 8 pi over h cube p squared dp is h over c cube nu squared d nu so that is equal to 8 pi nu squared d nu over c cube so the number of modes is this. Each mode, according to equipartition of energy, has an energy of 2 times 1 half of kT. Because for a harmonic oscillator, the kinetic energy part on the average gives you 1 half of kT, the potential energy part gives you another 1 half of kT. So it's kT. So the num energy energy per unit volume is equal to 8 pi nu square d nu over c cube times kt and that's uh, and that's the uh, equipartition law which was known as the rayleigh jeans law but the derivation outlined here was actually first due to Einstein if you look at this law, the radiation energy would become for very large frequency, very large. And the integral of this from zero to infinity is of course equal to infinity. So that's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Uh, because this says that in a box, in, in a black body a radiation box, the, for high frequency, there's an enormous amount of energy which is not observed, because according to Planck's law, it goes down if you look at the, the, the Planck's law, because there's an exponential factor in the denominator. Einstein later said, if Planck had drawn this conclusion, he would probably not have made his great discovery. And uh, so this is uh, it's very interesting that uh, it was through a long, wrong argument that Planck arrived at an idea that the energy are in units of H nu. I, I, I have a question. Yes? Uh, if Planck only made one mistake, then he could not possibly get the correct result. I mean, uh, uh, if Planck only make one mistake, yes. then it, it is quite impossible that he could get the correct result. So he, he must have made two mistakes that cancel each other so that he, he could get at the correct answer. Um, that, uh, the reason is not because he made one mistake, it's because he was confused. And when you are confused, you cannot say how many mistakes you made. Uh, the, it was Pais who looked very much in detail into Planck's derivation. And uh, Planck actually, uh, if, if you read that, that paper, uh, he said something like, uh, he assumed that the energies in uh, integral units of something, and that something he eventually, in order to fit the experiment and also to fit uh, Boltzmann's law, he came to the number h nu. So the answer to your question is that if you usually make, it's of course, if, it's of course correct that in a sequence of uh, logical steps. If you make one mistake, you have to make another mistake in order to counteract that mistake. 
but the whole thing was confused, so that this, it cannot be analyzed in such a fashion. But in any case, it is very uh, fortunate that Planck did not give the correct uh, uh, interpretation or the correct derivation, but he got the, correct, the gist of the correct result. And it was Einstein. There were many physicists, but it was Einstein who seized on this. And then he, without giving any real reason, he became more bold and postulated the uh, photon hypothesis, as we shall see. In 1905, Einstein wrote a paper in which he said, I want to propose a light quantum hypothesis for large new radiation behaves as if they consist of quanta of energy H nu. He then specified this as a heuristic principle. This suggests an inquiry as to whether the emission and absorption of light are constituted as if light were to consist of energy quanta of this kind. Out of this uh, hypothesis, he then derived this uh, photoelectric effect, namely that if you have a photon, if you have a light shining on a piece of metal, it sometimes can eject an uh, electron. Now this is called photoelectric effect and has been experimentally studied already for a long time. And he said that the, if the light consists of photon with an energy H nu, and if in order to eject the electron, there is a energy lost in lifting it out of the metal by the amount of phi, then the energy of the electron of the ejected electron should have should be h nu minus phi. So this is uh, in Einstein's uh, paper. Einstein made the heuristic proposal that the uh, photon, that light consists of uh, energy package of energy H nu and derived this uh, formula. He not only derived this formula, uh, he also went on and the in the next year he concluded that the, the material harmonic oscillators also have energies equal to n times h nu. In 1905, he was talking about the photon in packs of energy n h nu. Uh, next year, he pushed one further. Th this is characteristic of Einstein's intuition. He seized upon something which nobody has really felt to be the correct thing, and he pushed it further. So next year, he pushed it further and said that not only is the electromagnetic radiation so energy in units of H nu, but also material oscillators. As a consequence, he had this quantum theory of specific heats, which enjoyed great success. It is very interesting that uh, many, many years later, Einstein had said his 1905 paper was the only one he himself called revolutionary. Uh, I have thought about this. Why was it? Einstein had made three great contributions, special relativity, general relativity, and uh, the photon hypothesis. Why did he not call the other two uh, revolutionary? In fact, today there is the general tendency to think that special theory and general theory of relativity are more important contributions than Einstein's uh, photon hypothesis. Uh, be that as, as it may, it is, I think the reason that Einstein called his photon paper, or his uh, H new paper of 1905, the only revolutionary one, was because it was not logical. The other two are more logical, both special relativity and general relativity had some logical sequence of arguments given rise to the final result. 
But uh, the 1905 paper on the photon was illogical. If something is illogical, uh, that perhaps is more revolutionary. That's my interpretation of uh, why Einstein made this statement. Despite Einstein's success in explaining the specific heat of solids, no physicist believed his light quantum hypothesis. Because light waves were described by Maxwell's equation, you know, which new has nothing to do with energy. In 1903, in 1903, uh, Planck and Nernst and Rubens and Warburg, all important physicists in Berlin, in Berlin proposed to move Einstein from Zurich to Berlin and made him a member of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, which was the most prestigious position. In order to do this, they wrote a recommendation letter about Einstein. This was in 1913. And this is a paragraph of that letter of recommendation for Einstein. In sum, one can say that there is hardly one among the great problems in which modern physics is so rich to which Einstein has not made a remarkable contribution. That he may sometimes have missed the target in his speculations, as for example in his hypothesis light quanta, cannot really be held too much against him. For it is not possible to introduce really new ideas even in the most exact science with, without sometimes taking a risk. This is a most interesting uh, paragraph. It shows that Planck recognized Einstein's great contributions. Despite Planck's not believing in Einstein's light quanta hypothesis, he still wanted to appoint him to the Prussian Academy. What this paragraph vividly shows is how Einstein's ideas were not embraced by the general physicists. Then in 1915, Millikan discovered that the, the photoelectric formula of Einstein, which I showed, was correct. Even after the 1915 Millikan paper, papers verified Einstein's photoelectric effect, people did not be believe Einstein's theory. Millikan wrote in 1916, despite the apparently complete success of the Einstein equation for the photoelectric effect, the physical theory of which it was designed to be the symbolic expression is found so untenable that Einstein himself, I believe, no longer holds to it. So even after the experimental discovery or the experimental confirmation of Einstein's photoelectric effect, the discoverer himself, Millikan, did not believe that the Einstein's proposal was logically sound. So you see that the, from 1905 on, uh, the, the people, people were struggling with the phenomena related to the photon. But uh, despite various confirmations of Einstein's ideas, people felt that the, the idea was totally wrong. It's characteristic of Einstein that uh, despite such discouragement, he pushed on. So in 1916 and 1917, he wrote two papers which gave rise to the idea of the spontaneous emission and induced emission. These two papers are of profound importance because that they explain the origin 
of uh, lasers. When laser became uh, a real tool, it became clear how far-sighted Einstein was. And he wrote this paper at a time when everybody, all other physicists, were against his uh, photon hypothesis. It was only after the Compton effect discovery of 1923 that uh, people realized that Einstein's idea about the photon was the correct one. Einstein wrote in 1924, the positive result of the Compton experiment proves that radiation behaves as if it consisted of discrete energy projectiles. Not only in regard to energy transfer, but also in regard to momentum transfer. Uh, the Compton effect vividly showed that uh, the idea that the that light consists of uh, discrete packages which give rise to energy transfer and momentum transfer quantitatively. Uh, so after 1924, uh, people had to take the corpuscular theory of light seriously. There are therefore now two theories of light, both indispensable. This is still a continuation of Einstein. And as one must admit today, despite 20 years of tremendous effort on the part of theoretical physicists without any logical connection, the two ideas, particles and waves, both seem to be essential. So waves or particles after 1924 became the one of the main themes of theoretical physics. It is not waves or particles, it is both waves and particles seems to be correct. Now, our present understanding of this is really based only on field theoretical results which became clarified between the years 1927 to 1930. So today, we understand why the electromagnetic field is both particles and waves. Uh, and that, we have now a logical understanding of that through field theory. Uh, but that is uh, not something that uh, uh, we can go into details here. Next comes Bohr. In the year 1911, there was an uh, important conference in Belgium called the Sorvi Congress. You probably have read in high school chemistry textbooks about the Sorvi. Sorvi was a Belgian industrialist who perfected the way to make nitrogen compounds. Nitrogen compounds were very important for many industries like uh, fertilizers, like uh, steel e industry. So he made the uh, millions. And starting in 1911, he organized every few years a Soviet Congress. The first one was uh, uh, organized in 1911. That was a time when everybody knew that uh, Planck and Einstein had uh, something to say about the quanta and the radiation field. But uh, uh, people did not believe it. That uh, Congress, the proceedings of that, that Congress was published. It is called Radiation and quanta. And reading that, you find the following very interesting thing. First, that special relativity was almost not talked about at all. The reason that special theory was not talked about at all was because after 1905, 
although there were a few people who doubted uh, the validity of special relativity, but most practicing physicists embraced it. So it was sort of considered to be a closed chapter, and so there was essentially no mention of special relativity. Special relativity was accepted, but the quanta was the main problem. There were 20 participants. It's also very inter interesting to read the proceedings. All 20 particip participants were European. American science had not yet begun. If you take a historical perspective, you would realize that the science was dominated up to that time by Europeans. It was only starting in after the Second World War that American science came to the forward. And of course also there was no Asian participant in that 1911 conference. Uh, Asian science had to begin uh, many decades after American science. Now, to account for Bohr's uh, contribution, we had first to reflect on the fact that in 1897, Thomson discovered the electron. And after the electron was discovered, and Thomson knew that uh, the atoms are neutral. So therefore, he had an atomic model in the early 20th century, there was uh, the Thomson model. He thought of uh, the atom as uh, having as a uniformly positively charged uh, sphere embedded in which there were many electrons, so the, the total charge is uh, neutral. This was called the Thomson's plum Putin model. Then came uh, Rutherford's theory of 1911, uh, in which he found that the atom consists of a small nucleus of dimension approximately of an uh, angstrom, and of electrons going around it. So the atom is mostly empty space uh, with a tiny nucleus and with the electrons going around it. A very interesting thing was that although Japanese science was uh, uh, not yet coming to the forefront, there was already one Japanese theoretical physicist by the name of uh, Nagaoka, Changgang Ban Tailang. And in the year 1904, uh, Nagaoka also proposed a model, which was known as the Nagaoka model. It was uh, somewhat like the model of uh, uh, Thomson. Uh, Nagaoka was a student in Germany. In those years, the Japanese uh, sent uh, a few students to Germany. Uh, there was also a distinguished mathematician uh, who went from Japan to Germany. So Nagaoka and that mathematician were the two earliest Japanese uh, scientists. After Rutherford's discovery, the main question was why does the electron in the hydrogen, in the hydrogen atoms not continue to radiate and lose energy because as the electron goes around the nucleus, it is accelerated. And the accelerated charged particle would radiate. So it would continue to radiate and spiral in and eventually collide with the, the nucleus. So that was the main uh, problem. And that problem was not discussed in the Soviet Congress of 1911 because uh, Rutherford's idea was not yet uh, uh, discussed. 
However, Rutherford brought back the discussions about the quantum uh, from the Soviet Congress and uh, told uh, uh, Bohr about, about it. Bohr was his postdoc. And Bohr started to work on this and uh, he tried to explain the Balmer formula of 1885. You probably have all seen the Balmer formula for the hydrogen uh, spectra. The frequency is equal to a Rydberg constant R times uh, this formula, when n is equal to 3, 4, 5, etc., etc. And the R was known very accurately. Bohr in 1913 tried to explain uh, this with this uh, uh, Balmer series. He thought of a circular orbit of an electron around a nucleus. I'm sure uh, you will know this and the subsequent slides. He proposed that uh, an orbit which satisfies a certain quantum condition would be stable and would not radiate. He did not uh, give reasons why it would not radiate. He just uh, made a hypothesis that they would not radiate. And namely, the circumference 2 pi r times the momentum has to e be equal to a integral multiple of the Planck's constant. Uh, this letter, which uh, looks like uh, new, is actually V because uh, somehow uh, the PowerPoint had the difficulty uh, printing a, a rounded V. The electromagnetic interaction or the electrostatic interaction Z e squared over R squared has to balance the centrifugal uh, force. So you have the second equation. Out of these uh, equations, uh, Bohr derived the energy levels of uh, the circular orbit, orbit is equal to hr divided by n square, where r is given by that uh, long formula. And uh, putting the numbers in, he found r equal to 3.1, which was in excellent agreement with experiments. So that was uh, his, uh, 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 and he also had the second hypothesis that uh, the energy level difference, the energy difference between the second orbit and the nth orbit is that difference gives H nu and therefore nu is, is given by the formula at the bottom and uh, that is in agreement with uh, uh, with Balmer's formula. However, immediately he was questioned by uh, a physicist, I believe it was R. H. Fowler. Fowler said, okay, let's take your formula, R equal to 2 pi square, etc., etc. Let us apply this to the helium atom and compare it with the hydrogen atom. Then uh, everything is the same except Z is equal to 2 for helium. Uh, that m is the mass of the electron. So in that formula, for helium and for hydrogen, uh, every factor is the same except for z squared. And z squared is equal to 1 for the hydrogen, z squared is equal to 4 for helium. So uh, Fowler said r helium divided by rh is equal to 4. However, for the ionized helium, the ionized helium and the, elect and the hydrogen are, of course, essentially the same, with only a difference of uh, one case z equal to 1, the other case z equal to 2. So Fowler sa says that the ratio of these two should be 4. But experimentally, it was known very accurately. It's equal to 4.0016. So Fowler said, uh, how do you explain this? It shows that uh, Bohr was a very good physicist, Bohr immediately realized that uh, that is because 
the mass should be the reduced mass and not the electron mass. The reduced mass, if you replace m by the reduced mass, you get this, where m, where capital M is the mass of the nucleus. The mass of the nucleus is different for helium and for uh, hydrogen. So when you put that into effect, into the formula, you find the ratio of R helium divided by Rh is exactly equal to 4.0016 in excellent agreement with experiment. So with that additional uh, agreement with experiment, people had to sit up and believe that what the board said had great element of truth. But reactions were mixed. It was mixed for several reasons, which I shall uh, explain in a few minutes. But in, in 1905, Bohr said, it is still worse with the things I'm working with at the moment, for which the fundamental basis isn't even generally known, but for which everything depends on new experimental results. Everything depends on intuition and experience. What that means was that there was uh, no theoretical framework. It was all makeshift. It was all guessing by comparing uh, different experiments. In 1919, Bohr wrote to Rutherford, at present, I am myself most optimistic as regards the future of the theory. But uh, a few months later, he became very uh, depressed. Perhaps the atmosphere around that time could be captured by, was best captured by Planck in his 1919 Nobel speech. He finally got a Nobel Prize in 1919 because, in 1918, because by that time everybody realized that uh, the importance of the concept of quantum was, uh, uh, was most important. So he got the Nobel Prize. In his Nobel speech he said, if the various experiments and experiences from the different fields of physics provide impressive proof in favor of the existence of the quantum of action. The quantum hypothesis has, nevertheless, its greater support from the establishment and development of the atom theory by Niels Bohr. That which appears today so, so unsatisfactory will in fact eventually, seen from a higher vantage point, be distinguished by its special harmony and simplicity. This was what, what he said in 1918. I think this was a prophetic remark which proved to be correct after the development of quantum mechanics. In the, in the meantime, between the year 1913 when Bohr wrote his paper to the year 1927, when quantum mechanics became generally accepted, it was a period of great confusion. And that period of great confusion had been characterized by Pice in his uh, biography of Bohr. And he called that period, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. You recognize that these two lines were from the first sentence of uh, Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. Why was it so confusing? There were several major problems. First, Rutherford said in 1913, there appears to me one great difficulty in your hypothesis, namely, he was writing to Bohr. Bohr wrote to Rutherford, telling him about his uh, 1913 ideas. Rolfo said, 
there appears to me one great difficulty in your hypothesis, which I have no doubt you fully realize. Namely, how does an electron decide what frequency it is going to vibrate at when it passes from one stationary state to the other? When it jumps from an orbit n to an orbit 2, uh, how does it decide the frequency it should take? It seems to me that you have to assume that the electron knows beforehand where it is going to stop. That was one difficulty which uh, Bohr found it very difficult to answer. Second, n is the only quantum number. There should be three. Uh, we know, of course, later that uh, there are other quantum numbers. There's beyond n, there's L and M. In fact, for each degree of freedom, there should be a quantum number. But in Bohr's theory, there is only one n. And this was immediately appreciated. And everybody knew that the Bohr's was a two-dimensional problem. But uh, the hydrogen atom lives in three dimensions. So you must have the orientation. But that orientation problem proved extremely confusing to the people of uh, the period 1913 to 1927. And certainly there was the spin of the electron. Experimentally it was found these additional quantum numbers, R and M, were experimentally found, although theoretically not understood. And then it was found that there were some half integral quantum numbers, half integral in order to fit the experiment. And yet there was no understanding why there should be the uh, quantum numbers which were not integers. The atmosphere around that time, in my opinion, was best described by an eloquent passage from Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer in the 1950s uh, gave a series of lectures in Great Britain. It's called the, the Road Lectures. In that series of lectures, he said, our understanding of atomic physics, of what we call the quantum theory of atomic systems, had its origins at the turn of the century and its great synthesis and resolutions in the 1920s. It was a heroic time. It was not the doing of any one man. It involved the collaboration of scores of scientists from many different lands, though from first to last, the deeply creative and subtle and critical spirit of Niels Bohr guided, restrained, deepened, and finally transmuted the enterprise. It was a period of patient work in the laboratory, of crucial experiments and daring action, of many forced thoughts and many untenable conjectures. It was a time of earnest correspondence and hurried conferences, of debate, criticism, and brilliant mathematical improvisation. For those who participated, it was a time of creation. There was terror as well as exaltation in their new insight. It will probably not be recorded com very completely as history. As history, its creation would call for an art as high as the story of Oedipus or the story of Cromwell. Yet in a realm of action so remote from our common experience that it is unlikely to be known to any poet or any historian. I was a colleague of Oppenheimer's for 17 years, from 1949 to 1966. Uh, I, Oppenheimer was the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies, and I was first a postdoc, eventually a professor at the Institute, so I knew him very, very well. His was a momentous uh, life of great importance to the future of mankind because he was the director of the Los Alamos uh, bomb project. He was also an extremely eloquent person as this paragraph which I read to you vividly shows. 
He was also a very complex character. Uh, those of you who are interested uh, would find the many, many volumes of Oppenheimer's biography very interesting. There must be now at least 20 different uh, biographies, all of which showed that Oppenheimer was an extraordinarily brilliant uh, person with a very complex character, perhaps with certain deeply uh, hidden uh, sense of uh, insecurity. It's, uh, uh, I think every biography of Oppenheimer throws light on some new aspects of, of, of him, and yet uh, none, of, none of the single biographies captured the flavor of the whole person. The great confusion was finally resolved through the work of Heisenberg. You might say that uh, one of the reasons Heisenberg was able to make progress was because of the fact that uh, was already raised in the Rutherford letter to Bohr that I read that uh, in a jump, the amplitude of the jump from initial state I to a final state F must have two indices, I and F. So therefore the motion must consist not of a single index thing, but a two index thing. In other words, when the electron goes around the nucleus, in the classical idea, it was originally in the initial orbit, finally in the final orbit. But Rutherford's question already led to the conclusion that to describe the, uh, the electron, you need two indices. Both the I and F have to be there at the same time. And this idea, in fact, was not due to Heisenberg. It was already discussed in Göttingen. Around, around that time, the country where most of the new experimental results come out were in Germany. And there were a few centers in Germany where people pursued this, in particular in Göttingen and in Munich. Heisenberg was a graduate student obtaining a PhD in Munich with uh, Sommerfeld. And then he became a postdoc at the Göttingen being a, a postdoc in Max Born's uh, institute. And it was in that institute that the idea was being explored that in fact to describe the motion of an electron in the atom, you need two indices and not just one. This idea was pursued by Born, by Bohr, by Kramers, by Heisenberg in the years 1924 to 1925. Finally, in the period June 7th to 19th, uh, 2005, Heisenberg went on vacation to Helgoland because he had the hay fever. So he needed uh, to go to a place away from the cities. Helgoland is in northern Germany. Uh, it's a peninsula uh, into the North Seas. And there he had the brilliant idea, which eventually led to quantum mechanics. After he came back from Helgoland, on July 7th, he wrote a paper, which is now called the Women Paper. In that paper, he said, the present paper seeks to establish a basis for theoretical quantum mechanics founded exclusively upon relationship between quantities which are in principle observable. The orbit was not observable, but 
the emission amplitude was observable. And that emission amplitude need two indices, the initial state and the final state. So he was thinking of X, I, F. So in that paper, in that one-man paper, he tried to construct a certain mechanics based on X, I, F, not on a electron going around an orbit. He gave a copy of his paper to Bourne. Bourne was something like uh, 16 years his uh, senior. And Bourne was much more learned in mathematics than Heisenberg. And Bourne quickly realized that what Heisenberg was talking about was a matrix. And the manipulations that Heisenberg was making was matrix multiplication, which uh, had been, of course, which was well known in, to the mathematicians, but not to Heisenberg. So Bohm uh, said he should develop this idea, and he should write Heisenberg's ideas into a matrix form. But he felt that he needed somebody to collaborate. So he talked. He was traveling from Göttingen to Berlin, and uh, on the way he met uh, Pauli. Pauli was uh, 24 years old, a exceptionally brilliant physicist, but also an exceptionally uh, arrogant person. There was a famous story that uh, when Bohr, when Bourne met Pauli at the train station, Bourne said to Pauli, I have here a paper by Heisenberg. I think uh, uh, it should be further developed. Uh, would you like to collaborate with me on this paper? Pauli reportedly said, I advise you not to use your mathematical ideas to interfere with the Heisenberg's great physical ideas. Uh, especially that was when Pauli was still a graduate, a postdoc, while Bohr was a well-known physicist. So Bohr did not succeed in drafting Pauli, but he later uh, saw Jordan, who was another of his postdocs. In those days, there was no term, the word postdoc did not exist. They were all called assistants. And uh, he saw Jordan. So he collaborated with Jordan and wrote a paper. And that was called the two-man paper. Then Heisenberg came back, and the three of them wrote a paper, Born, Jordan, and Heisenberg. That's called the three-man paper. And those three papers founded quantum mechanics in those days called matrix mechanics, PQ minus QP equal to minus IH bar. How did Heisenberg arrive at that 1924 one-man paper? Many years later, he uh, wrote about that experience. He liked the mountain climb, so he compared his experience discovering quantum mechanics to mountain climbing. You sometimes want to climb some peak, but there is fog everywhere. You have your map or some other indications where you probably have to go, and still you are completely lost in the fog. In the fog. Then all of a sudden, you see quite vaguely in the fog just a few minute things from which you say, oh, this is the rock I want. In the very moment that you have seen that, then the whole picture changes completely. Because although you still don't know whether you will make the rock, nevertheless, for a moment you say, now I know where I am. I have to go closer to that, and then I will certainly find the way to go. That was a very good description of the groping nature through which Heisenberg launched a great revolution.
perhaps one of the greatest revolutions in the history of mankind. This was born a new mechanics, matrix mechanics. In the subsequent development of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, I will come to in future lectures. But uh, by, 19, by the early 1930s, it became clear that the quantum mechanics was a great revolution in physics, and the Nobel Committee was uh, thinking of awarding a Nobel Prize for it. Now, the detailed history of why it came about uh, that they awarded two prizes at the same time is not yet known. But what happened was that in 1932, the Nobel Committee announced that the 1932 Nobel Prize will not be offered this year. It was reserved. Then in 1933, they announced first that the 1932 Nobel Prize of Physics will be awarded to Heisenberg. And the 1933 Nobel Prize will be awarded to Schrodinger and Dirac. When the announcement came, it is obvious that it was profoundly disappointing to Bohr. Because the first born Heisenberg was Born's postdoc in 1925. And secondly, there was the one-man paper, two-man paper, three-man paper. And the PQ minus QP equal to minus IH bar was in the second and third paper, not in the first paper. Uh, so it, you can uh, realize that it was profoundly disappointing to Born. In fact, if you are interested in this, you can read the, the autobiography of uh, Born, uh, which he wrote in later years. Be that as it may, when the announcement came, Born wrote a letter of congratulation to Heisenberg. And uh, Heisenberg did not respond immediately. Finally, after about one month, on November 25, 1933, Heisenberg wrote to Born, Dear Herr Born, if I have not written to you for such a long time and have not thanked you for your congratulations, it was partly because of my rather bad conscience with respect to you. The fact that I am to receive the Nobel Prize alone for work done in Göttingen, in, collab in collaboration, you, Jordan, and I, this fact depresses me, and I hardly know what to write to you. I am, of course, glad that our common efforts are now appreciated, and I enjoy the recollection of the beautiful time of collaboration. I also believe that all good physicists know how great was your and Jordan's contribution to the structure of quantum mechanics. And this remains unchanged by a wrong decision from outside. Yet I myself can do nothing but thank you again for all the fine collaboration and feel a little ashamed with kind regards, yours, Werner Heisenberg. This is a very interesting uh, letter full of uh, complicated human uh, emotions. After 1933, for many years, Born was very bitter. Uh, you know, of course, that in the 1940s, uh, Hong Kong, my graduate student fellow, my graduate student days, fellow graduate student from Xinian Lianda was uh, a postdoc 
of uh, Max Born. I did not ask uh, Huang Kun about uh, what Max Born perhaps have uh, said about uh, his having missed the Nobel Prize of 1933. But uh, you can get some sense of it, of his bitterness in his autobiography. Uh, finally, in the early 1940s, uh, no, in the early 1950s, the Nobel Committee did award uh, Max Born a Nobel Prize, but not for uh, his contributions to the one-man, two-man, three-man papers, but for his uh, another paper, namely the probabilistic interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics, which uh, certainly uh, was a deserving contribution. After the one-man, two-man, three-man paper, the next important development was uh, the 1926 paper, Papers of uh, Schrodinger, which launched wave mechanics. In 1926, Schrodinger published six papers. It is a, uh, a historical collection of uh, great uh, contributions. About that, we'll come back to in another lecture. Thank you. Now I open this uh, class for discussions. Uh, any questions you want to ask, uh, I'll try to answer to the best of my knowledge. You said that uh, Millikan verified uh, the, um, the photo you actually effect after Einstein's dis uh, proposal of, of the light counter. And actually, what did, actually, what initiated um, Einstein's um, proposal of counter of light? Um, is it, was it a Planck's uh, Plan's discovery of the uh, bad body formula. Yes. Uh, which initiated uh, Einstein's proposal of light quantum. Just, uh, just want to know. Um, actually, what initiated uh, Einstein's proposal of the light quantum in the photoelectric effect? I didn't quite understand. Uh, why? Um, what motivated Einstein's uh, uh, 1905 proposal of light quanta? Uh, first, uh, he recognized that uh, logically. Uh, Planck's second paper of 1900 was uh, defective. It was a uh, not corrected derivation. Uh, but I think more importantly, he felt that Planck's idea was that the, in the exchange of uh, energy between the war and the radiation field, there's a quantization. But uh, Einstein was more focused on the electromagnetic field itself. And he said the electromagnetic field itself is in packs. In fact, did, didn't I have a, uh, did I have a, let me see.
I didn't have that. Um, the, I, the, the difference, both Einstein and Planck were guessing. The derivations were, uh, were defective. So it was, uh, but they had different uh, emphasis. Einstein was much bolder. And he said that uh, the electromagnetic wave itself delivers energy in packets. And uh, that was uh, not what uh, uh, Planck could uh, entertain. So that was the main difference. And in fact, I did not, uh, actually, I, I changed, I added some uh, transparencies, but uh, somehow it was not transmitted to, uh, to here, uh, which consisted of a number of discussions of 1911 at the Soviet Congress. And that showed very clearly the difference of the main emphasis of Einstein and Planck. And the main, the main difference is this idea whether the electromagnetic field itself uh, exerts energy in packets or in, as a continuous wave. Whether the matrix mechanics or wave mechanics uh, is uh, more instrumental to later development of quantum mechanics, or they are equally important? Uh, I mean, which one do you think would be more important to uh, later development of quantum mechanics, whether it's uh, wave mechanics or matrix mechanics? Whether uh, the matrix mechanics and wave mechanics, uh, which one is more important for the later development? What happened after the three-man paper was that uh, everybody uh, who was interested in it tried to solve the equation PQ minus QP equal to the minus IH bar uh, with a Hamiltonian, namely the hydrogen Hamiltonian. And uh, uh, Pauli, with his tremendous mathematical power, uh, solved the hydrogen that problem. Uh, within a few months, and uh, showed that uh, the matrix mechanics solution for the hydrogen atom does give correctly the Balmer formula. So immediately, uh, people realized that there's great truth to matrix mechanics. But uh, then, uh, in January, in February uh, of 1926, Schrodinger's paper came along. And uh, in, the, in the six papers of Schrodinger, he also showed that the wave mechanics and the matrix mechanics mathematically are equivalent. Then also around that time, Dirac came along and had a general framework and uh, associated the whole of both quantum mechanics, uh, wave mechanics and uh, Schrodinger's no, Schrodinger's wave mechanics and Heisenberg's matrix mechanics as uh, being the same thing uh, describable by Hilbert space. So therefore, after that, uh, it's clear that the mathematically wave mechanics and matrix mechanics are identical. However, for practical calculations, wave mechanics is much easier. Matrix mechanics is much more difficult. But the initiation of the whole thing was uh, with matrix mechanics. It was earlier. Uh, I will come to the conceptual origin of Schrodinger's idea uh, in another, uh, in one of the later lectures. In, in 1923, there was the, uh, in 1923, there was the experiment, uh, no, there was a proposal by De Bruyne about matter wave. Uh, did that proposal play any role in Heisenberg's development of the matrix mechanics? Yeah. Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, De Broglie proposed that the, 
that the matter uh, also is a wave. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, that has no impact at all uh, on Heisenberg's thinking. Uh, it, however, was uh, uh, immediately understood by Einstein as a most important uh, contribution. So Einstein told uh, Schrodinger that he should uh, study that. And indeed, uh, Schrodinger studied it and uh, found that it, had, it was very similar to some idea that he himself had uh, already published in 1922. And so struggling with his uh, original ideas in comparison with the Broglie's ideas, he came to the way to wave mechanics. That story will be in one of my later lectures. Uh, I think I should say that uh, while reviewing all this, uh, a natural question for me, and I'm sure for you, is uh, uh, how about the present? Are we in a situation where we are similar to uh, what was going on either in the year 1900 or in the year 1913? or 1925, or uh, we are very different. We are in a stage of uh, conceptual development in physics, which is very different from uh, those years. Uh, the answer to me is very clear. Uh, we are in a very different period. Uh, physics development over the long run uh, goes through cycles. And uh, the period that uh, we were talking about this morning, the period which uh, showed great uh, advances uh, in conceptual physics in the first 25 years of the 20th century, was a very productive period, which uh, uh, perhaps is not to be matched by any other period, except perhaps at the time that uh, Newton alone created uh, his uh, uh, calculus and his uh, gravitational theory. Uh, today's uh, problems which we face, today's uh, methods that we have available uh, are all very different from the situation of uh, the first 25 years of the 20th century. Thank you for the lecture. And I want to ask is, you just now talk about the black body radiation. And it said that uh, the photons were bouncing uh, within the black body. But I think uh, the uh, black body will uh, absorb all the energies. Uh, so you know, it means that the photon will uh, enter the black body and will not uh, bouncing back. Actually, the black body is both absorbing and emitting. Oh, so it can but be considered. But uh, once the equilibrium is established, you can switch off that and just make it bounce. So, it's a dynamic the, 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 the reason that it's called black body is because with black body you more easily arrange equilibrium. If it's black, you stay there for a period. Then it, uh, the radiation has come to an equilibrium situation. If at that time you then stop, you then make the black body a perfect reflecting bodies, oh. then the, you would be forever remain that way. Oh, okay, thank you. And another question is, you just talked about the uh, energy package, right? 
about the uh, uh, photon electron uh, uh, effect. And uh, is it uh, the same as the classical ones? Classical, the same as what? Uh, classical wave package. Uh, are they similar or diff quite different? Uh, about uh, classical wave, wave function. No, we no, got no. It. no. Um, No, the, 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 the it's called packet, but the, that it's packet is uh, uh, it means it's uh, in discrete units. So it it has nothing to do with. Uh, oh. Are you talking about uh, uh, a collection of uh, waves? Oh yeah, uh, no, it's quite different. Right? It's not in that sense. Okay, just for energy package. Yes, it's collection of. It's for discrete energy values for absorption and emission. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so next time uh, we'll talk about the uh, uh, phase factor.